Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Mark is here with you for Arcade Economics on a Tuesday morning and excited to be joined today by Jorge Ganoza of Fortuna Silver, who released their first quarter production numbers yesterday. And we are going to be digging into that as well as a lot of the other developments going on with the company. And certainly it's been a busy couple of years for you, Jorge, a lot of new projects that you have brought online and Exciting to see that, uh, especially Segala coming online right ahead of what's been rather stunning gold and silver rally. So great timing on that. And of course, I am joined also by Peter Spina of Gold Seek and Silver Seek, who is there with Jorge in Zurich for a conference. And we'll look forward to hearing more about what you guys are hearing and seeing from the European markets. And also joined by Dave Kranzler from Investment Research Dynamics again. And Excited to be here with all of you today. And Jorge, perhaps uh, we could start just giving an overview of the production numbers that you released yesterday for the first quarter. And you could let folks know how that came out and what's uh, how things are looking right now. Yes, thank you once again, Chris, uh, um, for the opportunity to speak to your audience here with uh, Peter and Dave. Uh, yes, we released yesterday quarter results <clears throat> for, for Q1. Uh, our production in terms of gold equivalent ounces is up 20% compared to a year ago, Q1 2023. It's a bit softer compared to the previous quarter, just uh, where we are traveling with respect to, to our, our uh, reserves and, and mine plans. Everything well in line with our guidance for the year. So, you know, I think we're traveling well to meet uh, you know, uh, the 480, 460,000 ounces in the mid-range of, of guidance. Um, we had a, a strong gold production, 89,000 ounces of, of gold, about a million ounces of, of silver. So all in all, in terms of production, a, a good quarter. And we also uh, took advantage of, of the press release to, you know, uh, inform the market of uh, our capital allocation uh, in the quarter, capital allocation initiatives in the quarter. So uh, we paid $40 million uh, towards our credit facility uh, in, in Q1. That's consistent with what we have been doing in the previous quarters. As you recall, uh, Chris, in the third quarter of 2023, we paid $40 million towards our credit facility in Q4, $41 million. And we follow up now with another $40 million payment in uh, Q1 of this year. Uh, our expectation is that we can be net cash positive you know, sometime this year. And we maintain a very low debt to EBITDA ratio of 0 0.3 at the end of 2023. So all of that is well. We want to put together a fortress balance sheet. Another thing we inform in the market is our share buyback program. We purchased about a million shares in the quarter. Uh, and last but not least, we, we repurchased uh, half of the royalty that the Seguela mine uh, had uh, with Franco Nevada. It's a 1.2% uh, net smelter return uh, on, on production that uh, Roxwell, prior to, to our acquisition, put in place with Franco Nevada. There was a buyback uh, on that royalty for 50% of, of the 1.2% royalty. And we executed uh, the buyback, the right to, to purchase half of that. So, you know, that's where we are allocating the, the capital that the business is generating. Yeah, we'll certainly dig into the share buyback. Would love to hear more about the process and how that went into that. Um, although one of the things that we've had a couple of questions on, as you mentioned, the production was down in the first quarter relative to the fourth quarter. I know you mentioned you're still on track for guidance, but if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the numbers that we saw that are a little lower this quarter and how that came about. Yes, the production, as I said, is uh, well aligned with our guidance for the year, although softer with respect to uh, Q4 of 2023. And that just has to do with how we are sequencing through our minds uh, at the beginning of the year. 
so, you know, for example, uh, Seguela had a stellar fourth quarter with about 43,000 ounces of gold uh, produced. Uh, in this first quarter of the year, production is in the low 30s, no, 31, 32,000 ounces produced. So uh, that just has to do with, you know, how uh, we cycle through the reserves in the pits, in the mine plants. Everything is aligned with what we expected, what we planned for, and what we have guided, right? Now, with respect to a year ago, you know, we're up 20%. Uh, and a bit softer with respect to the previous quarter, but nothing, nothing out of whack with our plans. No? Okay, and you've been running above nameplate capacity at Seguela, and I know you mentioned that might be able to get up to thirty percent. Is that still the plan to be pushing that a little bit higher in the coming coming months? Yes, you know the nameplate uh, design capacity of the Seguela mill is uh, one hundred and fifty four. Uh, dry metric tons per hour. And uh, we are running the mill at about 195. And as we indicated in the news release, we were able to reach over 200, 220 uh, tons per, per hour. So uh, we are really squeezing the lemon there. The team is doing an excellent job. And uh, I, I expect we'll be able to, to capture all of the opportunities that we built into the design is not always the case. You, when, whenever you build a, 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 a mine, a processing plant, you allocate uh, spare capacity in every aspect of the design because we work with estimates on rock hardness and, and uh, things like that, no? So, it is an expectation that you can capture all of those opportunities that you can have in the in the design, but not always the case. In 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 this case, we're being able to capture all of those opportunities. We're quite excited about that, and uh, so right now our work is not so much on the plant. I think we have a clear path there. Now our work has geared more towards uh, making sure that our plans for the mining are able to meet the new demands of the processing facility at higher throughput rate, right? Yeah. And one thing I've been wondering about, obviously, I think people are well aware, we've seen quite a stunning gold rally now up to 2372, which I guess if we had suggested this back when we were doing one of our calls in the fourth quarter, might have seemed a little far-fetched yet. Does that change anything you're doing or the timeline of anything? Or is there any any ways in which this current price now affects the processes you're going through? You know, I'm sure every miner, you know, we do our annual plan and then we run the mine with short-term models that we update and iterate constantly. So I am sure that every miner in the gold space, silver space is currently looking at the different iterations on reserves and, uh, and, and mine plans, right? And, and that's always something you do, you know, month uh, per month, quarter per quarter. Uh, but with this big swing, for example, we budgeted 2024 with $1,800 per ounce. So of course, with the spot prices today, you, you have to go back to your mind plans and reassess uh, if there are opportunities in the resources for the res new reserve conversion, or things so all of our teams are working on that when you, you're talking about the, this this is lower grade material that may have not been economical prior at that gold price and now economical or? yes and the audience needs to understand that uh, high grading in, in in the mining uh, uh, world is, is usually a bad word mm. so if if you we have a higher price we need to see if there is or that wasn't economic, but at current prices it is, because it was probably lower grade or requires a different mining method or whatever the case might be. So you go back and you iterate and you reassess that to see if you can bring it into the mine plan. And, and uh, you know, so sometimes it leads to lower grades uh, being mined and incorporated into the annual plan. 
but eventually over the life of mine, more ounces, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it, it, at the end of the day, it's an economic trade-off. It is an economic trade-off. It is a, a NAV analysis, no, a net asset value analysis. Uh, and I'm sure every miner right now is iterating on those. Yeah. Yeah, and Peter, I'm glad you brought that up. And because obviously with the higher price, yes, you do have more ounces that become economic. Jorge, is there a degree to which you're able to target those while the price is high and you can switch to some of the lower grade ounces? To what degree are you able to take advantage of that it, on a timeline? It, it is case by case. We operate five mines and, uh, you know, we have different uh, challenges and opportunities at each of the five mines. So it is a case on a case by case. It is on a case by case. For example, sometimes you don't have the flexibility. Uh, sometimes you do. So can I ask about in... Uh, in Peru with the silver price, if the silver price were to really accelerate, can you expand production down at the Cayo? Cayoma, today we are constrained by milling capacity and permits, right? Uh, going beyond the 1,500 tons per day would require permits. Uh, in the case of Seguela, it's not the case, for example. In the case of Seguela, we could run. So, you know, so each mine has a different, and particularly because all of our mines are in different jurisdictions, mm -hmm. right? So we are uh, have to abide by different uh, laws and, and, and then the geometry of the deposits and, and, and whatnot, right? For, for example, uh, the San Jose mine, mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a, an amount of resources that in late 2023, budgeting with $1,800 per ounce, we were not able to convert to reserves. And, and you know, $22 silver. Mm -hmm. We were budgeting with $1,800 per ounce gold and $22 per ounce silver. We were not able to convert those resources to reserves. Today, with $2,300 gold in the spot and $28 per ounce uh, on the spot market for silver, you have to sit and, and, and iterate and see what happens. So you, you do think there is a potential to expand the mine of life if these prices sustain? Yes, yes, there is that opportunity. So as I said, I am sure that most miners, if not all, are currently going back to the drawing board and doing mm -hmm. iterations, looking at, uh, at, uh, at the prices, uh, different price scenarios, running sensitivities. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and one more quick question before I'll turn it back over to you, Peter. Um, Jorge, obviously, we, we've talked about this on some of these calls before, but since it's something that comes up and people often wonder about, can you just talk about your approach that whether you're hedging in uh, any futures on the current production levels uh, in, t in terms of the price, whether you're locking in the price now or just continuing to let the market dictate that? You know, in our case, we don't hedge. No, we want our investors or shareholders exposed to the the upside in 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 the metal, right? And us as a miner be able to provide that leverage because that's what miners do, right? Uh, provide that leverage versus the underlying metal. Uh, so no, we're we're on hedge and we plan to remain on hedge. Okay, which is something that I think people are certainly happy about now and appreciate. And that said, Peter, it's been uh, about a year since we had you on one of these calls. And I know, obviously, you've been following the company. So first, any thoughts now that you've seen Seguela come into production uh, about and, and anything that you've seen over the past year, as well as any other questions you may have from Jorge? Well, I, as an investor, you look at the price of gold heading higher and you look at around 450,000 gold equivalent ounces uh, being produced, forecasted for this year. So as an investor, it's hard not to get excited by this, uh, this final expansion in, in cash. And I think that's something that Jorge has talked about quite a bit. And it's been a kind of a confusing uh, thing for investors. Hey, we had $2,000 gold in 2011 or almost, and the stocks were way higher. So what happened in the last 10 plus years um, and, and, and the answer is inflation. 
Now the costs have gone up, the mining costs have gone up, but finally we're at the point where the gold price and the silver price is running faster than inflation rates. So um, I, I think uh, it's really uh, exciting to watch uh, mining companies finally get to capture that. And in Fortuna's case with such, you know, huge production profile now, the company has grown tremendously from, um, you know, a few years ago, we just had Lindero coming online and now you, know, you have five mines, five different mm -hmm. countries and, and, and continuing to add to that exploration site. So it's a totally different company than it was years ago. So I, um, I couldn't be more pleased as an investor to see the company positioned where it's at with uh, metal prices starting to take off. And um, I just haven't watched, you know, Fortuna now for about 15 years. So um, we talked about you make difficult choices during difficult markets when the prices are cycling down and gold and silver are not so exciting, but then you're able to pick up assets and, and do things at a better price. Yeah, I think we've done something that has been very difficult and we try to be counter cyclical. Uh, I mean, we, we don't know where the market is gonna be in the future, no? but uh, we made an acquisition in a difficult market, and then we decided to launch into construction in a difficult market at a time when, when many of our peers were postponing capital projects mm -hmm. because investors, shareholders were very risk averse. They didn't want, you know, there was no money coming into the sector. Uh, it was out of favor and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, risky constructions in, with inflationary pressures were something that investors didn't want. And, and uh, well, we, we decided to be counter cyclical to go ahead with, with what we thought was, you know, value, a, a good value creation opportunity for the long term. And now we're here. Uh, we're at a conference where a lot of uh, our peers are talking about their new, you know, projects, the projects they want to advance. When we did our homework mm -hmm. for the last two years, and now we can talk about the production that we have there not the project that we have ahead of us, right? So, uh, I mean, we're not only the only ones in that space. There are a few other companies that have done that, but not many. Uh, and, and the other thing I would like to add to that is the challenge for us as uh, prices start to move is to keep a lead on cost mm -hmm. so we can preserve on margin. That is, I think, uh, moving forward as, uh, you know, as we all expect these, these prices continue to climb. Uh, we, we, we really work hard to keep a lead on, on our costs and, and preserve the margins. Yeah. yeah. I think that's something that the industry had a lot of controversy around years ago when there was a lot of push to, 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 to fix this. Yes. And, and, you know, this is an industry that has some structural bottlenecks. We all have to recognize that. Uh, and what do I mean by that? Uh, it's a bomb and bust industry. Mm. So there is not enough talent. There are not enough, uh, you know, uh, service providers with experience. Mm. Uh, there, there are bottlenecks in the manufacturing lines for the equipment we use, on the, on the, you know, manufacturing lines for the consumables we use, like tires, uh, trucks, yeah. uh, crushers. So when everybody and their dog wants to build their gold mine, yeah. uh, and that happens in, 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 in a rising market, uh, we start encountering those bottlenecks. And what happens is that we start seeing cost creep, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so you, we have to keep discipline. We have to be smart. We have to learn from, from past uh, you know, experiences, not so in the so distant future. Sorry, in the whole distant past, yeah. right? Uh, so uh, keeping a, a lead on cost, I think, is going to be key this time around as prices move. Yeah, it's 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 a huge. I, I think you mentioned about fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars an ounce right now is average production costs, all sustained costs. So the margins have been compressing, compressing. So uh, it's it's the industry, the whole sector hasn't had a lot of capital flowing in our interest. And now, like you said, it's going to flood in and then everyone wants to do the same thing at the same time. So the cost must be hit the, the, the stream. Yeah. The roof. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that, that actually touches on another question that came in. Uh, we had someone wondering how the overall rising costs are affecting Fortuna compared to some of the other large miners, 
especially at some of the higher cost of production mines, has there been a significant uptick there? I know last time we talked, you were estimating about a fifteen fifty all in sustaining costs throughout twenty twenty four, and anything you could share on how that's been moving so far yeah. in the first quarter. You know, just like everybody else, over the last uh, several quarters, we've been experiencing, over the last two years, we've been experiencing creeping inflation in, in key consumables, uh, in, in some services, across all of our jurisdictions. You know? And I think there's been a general theme, theme across industries. Uh, but those general inflationary pressures have been abating. I don't think, uh, no, I don't think we are, we're not seeing those uh, pressures that we were, uh, were, were biting in 2021, in 2022, they're being abating in 2023. We're not seeing them in 2024. Having said that, in the case of Mexico, uh, the, the local currency appreciation, the, the appreciation of the Mexican peso uh, has triggered in, in you know a rising cost and uh, I think that is a feature that's particular to Mexico right now. Mm -hmm. Not that's the one jurisdiction where we continue to see a cost creep driven by the appreciation of the local currency. But it's not the case in in all the other jurisdictions where we operate. Okay, and Dave, I'll turn it over to you. I know you had some questions today, and as always, thanks for being here. So why don't you take it away? Sure. Um, just circling back to Segala for a second, I noticed you started stripping at Kula. What, what's the, how's the grade at Kula, the average grade compared to NCN and um, Antenna? You know, once Kula is in full production, it'll be one of the highest grade uh, pits in 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 the world, you know, it's, it's six grams, you no, know? uh, four and a half, six grams, depending where where we are in the reserves. Uh, but we're not mining yet. We are uh, we're not mining ore. We're stripping. Right. My cooler will come later in the year, so we are advancing. We have done our homework with infill drilling to gain even more certainty on, on, on the reserve. And uh, we are, have been working on the pre-strip. So uh, one thing is that our, our strip ratio, which in the last year hovered around four and five in the first quarter of uh, this year, uh, at that one mine, our stripping ratio is right now at six. Right, so we're seeing a big higher strip ratio. That's gonna, you know, weigh on cost, uh, and but everything well within the guidance that we already provided to the market because that was planned for, right? So uh, yeah, you know, we're 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 moving ahead with our plans, uh, uh, and 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 no surprises. So, so will you blend when you start mining at Kula? Or will you blend that ore with the other two pits, or process it separately? No, absolutely. We the mine plan calls for the antenna pit, which was our starter pit, to be the anchor for production. So the bulk of production is supplied by the antenna ore body, uh, and then we have Ancien and Kula supplementing, you know, smaller tonnages at higher grades. Right, so there we manage a blend. No, metallurgically, both uh, the three deposits behave the same, uh, so no issues there. So uh, yeah, and, and that's all within well within our plans, right? So um, with at Yeramoco, have you? Did, how are things going there? Do you, do you have any more visibility on how much longer you think you can extend the life of that mine? You know, uh, for the benefit of your audience, when we made the Roxwood acquisition back in 2021, Yaramoco was set for closure in 2023. So instead of a closure in, in 2023, we had a superb year where we even upgraded guidance for the year and we finally delivered about 119,000 ounces. Uh, and we are planning for a very strong 2024, a very strong 2025 based on the reserves that we have 
in inventory, and then sometime in 2026, we exhaust reserves. But that is the picture of the moment. We continue exploring, and uh, we haven't had the, the type of success we've been enjoying with the exploration at that mine is, is, uh, is you know, gaining 20, 30,000 ounces per quarter. So we haven't made a, like a one monumental discovery, but it's just small gains, small incremental gains as our development advances and, 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 uh, and we get to areas where, you know, the drilling uh, showed some uh, opportunity, but we couldn't really, you know, achieve a research. Once we get there and we drift with the tunneling, we are able to get more certainty and add 20,000 ounces, 15,000 ounces here and there. So on the aggregate, that's the, the type of gains we're making and it's working well. So, you know, you know how this business is, Dave. I cannot give uh, guarantees regarding what's going to be 2026 and onwards, but I can tell you that we continue pushing the envelope on the exploration and, and, and the development. Uh, Yaramoko is uh, one of our exploration priorities in 2024. Yeah, no, I, I kind of had a gut feeling that might happen at Yaramoko, and the, uh, certainly the higher price of gold helps. Absolutely. As we were saying at the beginning of the conversation, at all of our minds, we're currently running iterations on our plans and, and, and seeing it. Yeah. So um, just a quick one at Lindero. Um, when do you expect the leach pad expansion to be complete? Towards the end of the year. That's uh, uh, worth spending a bit of time for the benefit of the audience here. Our ASIC uh, projection our all in sustaining cost uh, projected for, for that mine this year is high, 17, around $1,700 per ounce. And, uh, but that all in sustaining cost carries $400 of the leach pad project. That's a, the leach pad expansion is a $41 million budget that needs to be executed in 2024. But that capital project serves the mine for a decade. No, so we have to take the pain of the investment today and uh, set up the mine for the future, right? So uh, now, of course, prices are helping now because seventeen hundred dollars. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, we always want to have lower costs, but it doesn't look that bad when you think of twenty three hundred dollars gold. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I, I noticed, I thought I saw that the strip ratio was like 0.5 or something. in, in Yeah, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. You know, the life of mine strip ratio is 1, 1 1.2. That's the life of mine strip ratio. Mm -hmm. So within that, we will have oscillations. You should expect that by year end, we are at around 1, 1 1.1. And uh, so we are benefiting in the beginning of the year from a bit lower strip. But there is no free lunch. In the second half of the year, strip ratio is likely going to be higher and we'll end up with a balance. So uh, that's how it usually behaves. Then just two more quick questions. Um, at, at San Jose, any any kind of updates on what's going on with the SE vein? You should expect a, an exploration news release this month of April, in the coming week, two weeks. Uh, we are currently drilling with three, four rigs, uh, and the program is advancing. The, the first phase of the program was focused on uh, enhancing our knowledge of the vein, you know, really getting an understanding of the orientation, the dip, the behavior of the structure. And uh, that took a while because Jesse, uh, it's a bit of a different animal with respect to what we've been mining in the past all these years at that map. That is good, no? It, 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 it strikes at a different orientation and, uh, and, and that opens a world of possibilities for the exploration of the mine. A trend, a, a, a structural trend, uh, a, a trend of mineralization that we had not recognized there in all these years. Now, the first months were dedicated to understanding that, that new uh, 
uh, vein. And now it's more about volume, drilling, putting the meter edge to see if we can build the resource. As I always say, you know, yes, it has been an exciting discovery. Now we need to see if the exciting discovery turns into an exciting resource that we can feed into our mine plants. We're not there yet. Uh, we're doing the work to get there by mid-year or, or Q3 and, and, and see if we can plug it in into our mine plants, hopefully at these high prices, and, and uh, continue to see uh, the San Jose mine uh, producing beyond 2024. <clears throat> the most analysts have already assigned zero value to the San Jose mine in their net asset value models. No? Uh, most of the bank analysts and the, the you know, guys who cover Fortuna have already discounted uh, San Jose. Let's see if we can revert that. We're working for that. So just uh, one more quick question. I don't know if you have the answer to this off the top of your head or not, but um, do you have any idea of what the uh, average cost per ounce of gold that you received in Q1, how that, how that differ, the differential between Q1 and Q4, because I have to assume the average price went up. You know, I, what I can advance to you is the price that we sold gold at in, you know, in, I cannot provide cost figures. Those will be provided when we, we put out the, 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 our financials. But in terms of the gold price, you know, if you do the average for the quarter, in the fourth quarter, we sold gold at $1,990. That mm -hmm. was a realized price. And in in the in the fourth, in the Q1, if you just do your math, you arrive at around $2,080. No? So uh, that's, you know, the, the type of price we were able to, to achieve. And that just comes from you can you can do that math easily just averaging prices for the quarter right mm -hmm. it's in that range yeah. that's all i've got it's bent, bent. it looks great yeah i well, appreciate that dave and all right a couple of questions on some of the things you mentioned there we did have someone ask if selling the san jose mine has ever been a consideration and curious if that has ever come up you know, mining companies, when they have an asset that uh, is running low on reserves or is about to get exhausted, uh, certainly consider uh, disposing of the asset so they don't bear the, the closure costs. And, and that's something that we all consider and think about. Uh, But you also have to weigh in your take on expiration potential, mm -hmm. right? And uh, we currently have the Yesi vein in front of us. And uh, I say that uh, we want to give Yesi uh, a good chance before we start entertaining, you know, other, other options. Uh, but it's something that we all consider when we are coming to the end of uh, reserves. You know, and I don't say the end of the life of the mine. And that's why I'm careful with that. I say the end of reserves. Those are the reserves that we're we're exhausting the reserves that we have in inventory. We're talking about prices. Uh, uh, we're iterating at, at this at twenty eight dollar silver, twenty three hundred dollar gold. Uh, perhaps I come up with more reserves. I don't know. And then the mine has more research. Mm -hmm. So we're the, coming to the end of the life of the mine sounds uh, like there is no more. Mm -hmm. And in this business, the geologists should be the first ones to arrive and the very last ones to leave. <laughs> so we, we have the guys there working with three, four rigs, a well-funded exploration program and legitimate targets. So yeah, let's see, we have to, let them let them do their work and revisit the the subject by mid year. Yeah, and along the lines of extending the reserves, uh, you talked about Yaramoko before, and in the press release, you mentioned that you were able to extend the mineralization at Zone Fifty Five. 
curious if there's anything else you could mention about that. And also if you're seeing some of the same high grades that you've been getting there. You know, what I can advance to you is that, uh, as pointed out in the news release, our development on the fringes of the deposit continues funding the structure with continuity and grade. You know, so it is now for us to do our work and, and try to bring that into the resource inventory. You know? But what I can say is consistent with what we said in the news release is uh, our, our extension of drifting, drifting on the different levels of the fringes of the deposits and uh, continues to, to identify uh, the structure with the uh, gold grades. Courage. Okay. And there was also a question about the production, whether that's going to dip in 2025. There was uh, an analyst that had concerns about that and I know you're still targeting to get to that 500,000 ounce per year mark. What, what are we looking at going in the years ahead, especially in between the time now where conceivably Diambasu could come online what, what do you expect going forward? You know, undoubtedly, we have challenges and opportunities in the portfolio. We have mines that are running short on reserves. We just talked about the exploration opportunities that remain at Yaramoco and, and, and even at uh, San Jose. So it could be that perhaps by the end of this year, we're looking at another year at San Jose, another year at Yaramoco. I don't know that right now. Right. So if you take a picture of the moment, no, without any exploration success at the San Jose or Yaramoco mines, and without any exploration success at Seguela, without any exploration success at uh, the Ambasud, the picture of the moment is that in 2026, we start seeing production declining. But this is a very dynamic, uh, uh, this is a movie, not a picture. Right. Uh, the, the things are happening. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, this year we're drilling, we have our largest exploration funding ever, $41 million. Uh, we have over 200,000 meters of drilling across the portfolio. You know, I, like they say the financial industry, past performance is no measure of future success. So, you know, I cannot promise discoveries, but uh, I can promise you we're spending the money and we have legitimate targets and we're hitting them hard. Mm -hmm. So it could be that, you know, by end of this year, we can sit and, and update our life of mine plans and have a different picture. And, and that's mining, that's, that's a business. Every mining company over time, in, in particularly in precious metals, has a declining grade profile and a decline, not a declining grade profile, but a decline, declining annual production profile because we exhaust our deposits, right? So that's no surprise. Okay. And another question that came in, someone was concerned about the GNA cost company-wide. And I know there is a distinction between the GNA and also the subsidiary GNA. And perhaps you could just explain that for people. Yes, absolutely. Our corporate GNA is quite competitive and we benchmark that all the time. If you look at all the financial statements, uh, we report uh, about sixty million dollars a year in in GNA, but that is GNA at sites and at corporates. It's it's a a lump sum of of the uh, business GNA across subsidiaries and across uh, corporate. In the NDNA, we provide a, a breakdown of of the figure. And you can see that our corporate DNA on a quarterly basis hovers around six to, to $8 million on a quarterly basis, right? Uh, you know, $25, $26 million a year in corporate DNA. And, uh, you know, we benchmark that figure against uh, our peer companies and, and, and on a per ounce basis. And as an absolute basis for a company with our geographic dispersion or complexity, and it's quite competitive. No, I, I think uh, we're we're comfortable with where we are, but uh, you have to be careful and and read, 
when you look at the financials, because in the MDNA, we provide the breakdown of the $60 million figure. It's not $60 million in corporate DNA. You know, we manage uh, five mines and a project, and uh, a little over half of what you see in the $60 million is allocated to the management of those operations mm -hmm. in, in six countries, mm -hmm. right? Okay, well, I appreciate you going through that. And Peter, I wanted to pass it back to you if you had any more comments or questions. Well, I, I my main <clears throat> question was about the economics, the reserves now that gold and silver price, rising prices bring into uh, play these lower, mar lower <coughs> rates. Um, but I guess the other question is just, uh, what do you do with all this incoming cash flow? If, if this is uh, going to sustain, if the gold price is running, um, you have been buying back shares, you're reducing your debt, you're fortifying the balance sheet. Um, is there still opportunities in M and A, or, or what? Any other opportunities? You know, we are always uh, keeping an eye and, uh, on on acquisition opportunities. What we have been favoring uh, since the Roxco acquisition, what we've been favoring is opportunities where uh, we are willing to take higher geologic development risk and lower financial risk, mm -hmm. right? And Chesar speaks to that, or, or acquisition of Chesar resources in, in, in 2023, no? that came with the Dian Basud project. Uh, you know, we add value deploying our capital, but more importantly, deploying our knowledge. So we like to acquire pre-development stage projects where we take some geologic risk, we're comfortable with that, and then uh, we develop the project and unlock value through, through that. So you, those tend to be projects, you know, that bear lower financial risk, no? Uh, you can buy them at a deep discount to NAB, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because they have all the, you know, still geologic risk, still permitting risk, still uh, construction risk. But those are risks that we as a mining company must be happy to take, right? Yeah. So we can buy things at a deep discount to NAB and then unlock that value. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's what we did at Seguela. That's what uh, we're trying to do at, uh, at the Ambassu. No? Very nice. Well, uh, and a dividend potential if, if uh, the cash keeps piling on the uh, uh, absolutely no. I mean, first we've been trying to be opportunistic on the share buyback. Mm -hmm. We have the non-normal core seizure bid program in place. Uh, it it expires in May. We're already working to renew. Uh, and uh, that's the first one, right? And then a, a dividend is something that we would certainly consider. And uh, but we. You know, I think le lessons learned throughout the cycles, no? Last cycle, investors were very pushy. In last cycle, I'm talking about 2004 through 2011, investors all wanted growth. Mm -hmm. Growth, 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 growth. No matter at what cost, but you had to show growth. And, uh, you know, when you get that pressure from your shareholders, from your investors, it's difficult, and a lot of companies yielded and and, and started developing th developing things that didn't really make any sense, right? Uh, you know, for example, Barry trying to develop uh, Pascualama in Chile and things like that, multi-billion dollar projects that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, didn't really pan out. And, and, and there were several examples of that. Uh, we have to keep discipline. And I, I go back to what I said at the beginning, keeping a little cost mm -hmm. and don't do stupid MMA. Yeah. <laughs> Please. No? So yeah. keep the cash, strengthen the balance sheet. And if you don't see those really deep value opportunities that are difficult to come across in a rising market, mm -hmm. dividend out. Mm -hmm. Give the money back to the shareholders. That uh, no? makes sense, yeah. yeah. Okay, any final questions, Peter? I'll do it on me. What's that? Uh, no, that's that's all I have. Okay. Um, 
Well, one last one wanted to go over. Jorge, you did have a press release out. This was shortly after our last call where you did discover the new Kingfisher prospect at Seguela and also had an exploration update at Diamba Sud. And perhaps you could just walk through the highlights of what you found at both locations there. Yes, I, I said that we have some high value opportunities in the portfolio and uh, the, the focus of, of our $40 million uh, uh, company-wide exploration budget, uh, you know, Seguela and, and the Ambassu are, are big recipients of, of those funds. So at, uh, the, at Seguela, we have multiple prospects, a commanding land position, and Kingfisher is just the emergence of uh, one of those multiple targets that we have, and we're quite excited about it. It is right under our noses, uh, right next to uh, our, our Sandberg deposit, which was a, a, a prospect that emerged two years ago. Uh, Still early days of exploration. We don't have a resource, but every time we're hitting, we're drilling, we're hitting, and uh, we already defined a strike length of about a kilometer, a little over a kilometer. Uh, all of our drilling up to now is, is relatively shallow, hundred uh, below 150 meters, more in the range of 80 meters, 85 meters below surface. So it's shallow drilling, and and uh, you know. Uh, it's, it's looking very coherent, very consistent, with good grades, as we pointed out in the news release. So we're quite excited. But I think that reinforces our thinking on the potential and our excitement on the potential of uh, Seguela to continue giving. Uh, that's one of the reasons, one of the drivers behind us acquiring rocks was our conviction that Seguela held tremendous exploration potential. And uh, we're working hard to capture that for the benefit of our shareholders. Okay, and in there you touched on Sunbird. I was wondering if you could just update the timeline of Sunbird and when we could conceivably see that going into production. Right now, we're working on that because we're doing trade-offs with underground mining as well. And that's another opportunity that we have at uh, Seguela is uh, Sigela, we have never done an assessment of underground options. And uh, I expect the work, which is well underway, be completed by mid-year at the latest. And with that, we will be able to schedule, uh, you know, if it starts open pit or, or certain portions underground, or when does the underground come into play. Uh, so right now, you know, Sunburn is a deposit that comes you know, I, I believe it's scheduled for sometime in 2026 right now. But don't take my word for that because I, I but, but it's not in 2024, it's not in 2025. Um, but the, the big opportunity there on the mainland side is uh, trade offs with underground mining studies. Okay, well, appreciate that update. And Peter? How about one? I have one final question. Where do you see Fortuna? In five years in the year 2030. Yeah, you know, we are not looking to get any bigger. I, what I would like to see in Fortuna uh, in, in the years to come is a company, you know, that is not so so fixed on, on, on size of ounces, but quality of ounces. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we've been working on, Peter, over the last years, to improve the quality of the portfolio. And what do I mean by improve? I want assets that can produce source about half a million ounces. So right now I'm not concerned with getting bigger to a million ounces, mm -hmm. no, half a million ounces, but with a with our cost, well below industry average. Today the industry ASIC, the average for the global gold mining industry hovers around fourteen hundred mm -hmm. today. That's a moving target, right? But so I want all of our mines to be performing under fourteen hundred dollars. And I want predictable reserves. I want every asset in the portfolio with 10 years plus. Mm -hmm. Today, our, our portfolio is not that balanced. Mm -hmm. We have assets that are low cost, long life, others 
are higher cost with shorter life. Mm -hmm. No, on the average, I look at fifteen hundred dollars per ounce ASIC. No, and three million ounces in reserves. That's a picture of the moment, yeah. but it's not bad. No, so we need to continue working on the exploration, and when we make acquisitions like Chesser, keep that in sight. No, we we need. Uh, over the next years, I believe, to put together a more balanced portfolio mm -hmm. of, of uh, and it's not just getting bigger, but getting, I think, being a mid-sized producer like us in, in the half a million ounce range is competitive, uh, and, and we just want, you know, more quality with respect to life of reserves, and, uh, and we're getting there, yeah. we're getting there, we're getting there, you know? Yeah. Lots of investments going into to achieving that. To, to achieving that, yes, and the quality and the type of assets that we have uh, been acquiring, the money we're putting towards exploration, and and the type of new projects we're bringing into the portfolio are all aligned with that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, last cycle, as I said, it was about growth and 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 more ounces, no matter at what cost. Mm -hmm. That's a losing formula. Mm -hmm. Over time, it is. On the short term, it might work. Yeah. Over longer term, it is not a, a winning for me. Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's certainly exciting to see what's happened in the past three years and not, not all that long ago when you did the Rock School deal and people were concerned about West Africa. And obviously we had a bear market in the mining stocks when, while you were building the mine. And certainly it's uh, just congratulations to you that now the mine is up and running and really nice that it's coinciding with this rise in the gold price and certainly shaping up to be quite a year in 2024. And uh, yeah, Pierre, it'll be fun to do this again in 2030 and see what has happened since then. And God only knows what the world will look like at that point. But either case, uh, Dave or Peter, did you have anything else you wanted to get out there before you wrap up? No, that's all I've got. I, I just want to say, I mean, the, you know, every time I, I put the Rocks Gold acquisition in perspective, I'm just in awe of how successful it's been. Yeah, it, it is. It's really a, a transaction that has seeded the company for the future in the most exciting jurisdiction. That is not challenge free. No, uh, that we have our challenges. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we are designed and, and structured to meet those challenges. And we're being able to de deliver successfully and, uh, you know, and harvest. Mm -hmm. No, we, we want uh, to be in a position to harvest for shareholders. And uh, yeah, I think we're in a very strong position today with a very strong balance sheet, with meaningful production, with competitive cost, and uh, a, a, a portfolio that you know we're working to to manage and balance, right? Well, a job well done. It's, it's, it's exciting to see the rise in the stock price, uh, especially over these past two months. And as we're wrapping up here, we now see that we're above twenty three eighty in gold. So, anyway, just uh, really encouraging to see when projects go as planned, and especially you have some good conditions in the market. So, that said, I thank you all. For I have a question for David. Can I ask a question? Because I answer questions from everybody. I, Jorge, I, do you have any questions you'd like to ask today? Yes, I have a question. <laughs> you know, what do you make, David, of, uh, Dave, of uh, you know, what, what's happening with the, with the employment data that, you know, mm -hmm. was, uh, as I understand it, suggesting, uh, you know, the, the market still uh, uh, hot in the labor market? Which you know intuitively supports the 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 stance on on you know higher rates for longer, mm -hmm. and in spite of that, we're seeing someone is buying gold yeah. aggressively. So yes. that is counterintuitive, right? You it usually works the other way: weaker mm -hmm. employment data, right. mm -hmm. better gold market. Now we are seeing you know, uh, stronger employment, uh, labor data, uh, and, and, and go going up. What, what's happening yeah. there? <laughs> what, what, doesn't make sense. What, what happened? Any thoughts there, guys? 
You're going to get him I mean, riled up on this one. It, it, <laughs> I mean, if you look under the hood at the employment report, <clears throat> it's actually pretty weak. I mean, all of the jobs over the last, I don't know, two years, 18 months have been part-time jobs. And a lot of those are people who have to work multiple jobs to make ends meet. The full-time jobs have actually been declining. So, and that's that's why the market rallied last Friday when, when that number hit, because, you know, the headline number looked great. And that's that's what the government wants you to think, right? The Biden government wants the public to see that headline number, which comes from the establishment survey, and, and think, oh, geez, I got to vote for Biden because the economy is great. I might be able to get a job now. And and the the rest of the data comes from the household report. And that's that's considered to be more accurate than the establishment data. And you look at that report and it's like, wow, it's, it's really not a great jobs report. That said, I think <clears throat> I think the reason why treasuries are going up in price, even though the market, you know, and the bond investors are smarter than stock investors. They have to be right because it's supposed to be a lot less risky investment. Um, and they look at the, the economic data with a more critical eye. And so you would think, OK, well, if the employment data is really weak under the hood, rates should be falling, but they're rising. And that's because I think um, I, I think we've got a second wave of price inflation coming. It's probably going to be worse than the first wave that we had. And you're seeing that with, you know, in the prices of of commodities, right? Gold, silver, um, not that gold and silver are necessarily commodities, but copper, you know, and all, all these commodities are rising in price. And if you read, you know, if you read like the the um, economic reports that are based on on producers and wholesale data, they've been talking about, you know, paying higher prices for their inputs now for several months. And at some point that and also oil, I mean, look at oil. So I think we're going to have another wave of inflation coming around. And interestingly, you've probably heard of Adam Hamilton. He's a pedantic, you know gold market analyst, stock analyst. Um, he, he does like exhaustive statistical work. It's kind of boring to read, but I mean, it's it's good stuff. And he put out a, a study in 2015 that showed that the best periodic rates of return for gold are during cycles when the Fed's actually hiking rates, right? And, and the reason for that is, is that the market looks at it and says, oh boy, the Fed's way behind the curve on taming inflation and that's becoming apparent still and so you know i think i don't know if they're going to raise rates but i don't i don't think they can lower rates because they're going to they're going to risk a big sell off in the dollar and also i think they have to keep them at this level just to try and hope that it might you know rein in inflation which i don't think it will so that's why i think the prices of the metals aside from the fact that obviously the eastern hemisphere particularly china is buying a boatload of physical gold right now. And we just saw in, in March that India imported a record amount of silver. So, um, you know, the Eastern Hemisphere and Asia, they just continue to, to buy physical gold and silver hand over fist. Okay. Yeah, that's, that sounds, I, I'm, I agree with you, Dave. It sounds like there's another wave of inflation coming and it's the gold price is sniffing it out, but there's yeah. also other geopolitical uh, games and other influences. So it's, 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 there's a lot of things going on right now. It's quite, a, it's a, it's a very interesting moment, I think, for the gold and silver markets and the whole monetary system as well, and the dollar and so on. You know, sometimes people ask me about, uh, recurrently about what do I think about gold price? I, I, I am agnostic on gold price because I have to mine it with high prices, low prices, medium prices. It is uh, you investors who have to time your investments. Yeah. I'm stuck here every day, so uh, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think about timing things. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's uh, good to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. yeah, well, hopefully we're just in the early days of the rally and interesting to think what could happen from here, especially in a seemingly chaotic world, unfortunately, but either case or hey it's great to see the progress you're making with fortuna and certainly being able to capture what we're seeing in the markets right now so 
Thank you as always for being here. And Peter, it's great to catch up with you again as well. Really excited that you guys got to meet up there in Zurich. And of course, my dear friend, Dave Kranzler, thank you for joining us from Denver this morning. And uh, yeah, you'll, you'll have to get another uh, big silver panda soon too with this kind of rally that we're going through. <laughs> and either case, I also just thank everybody who is watching at home. Sure, appreciate you being here. Hope you found the call helpful and we're going to wrap up for today, but we will see you again soon. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And